morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Ren United Methodist Church virtual worship service. And we are here this morning to worship together and are glad that you're joining us via Facebook Live. And it looks like our Zoom launch is not uh, taking effect. And I need to briefly excuse myself here so I can adjust the camera up slightly. <clears throat> so for those of you who have been attempting to get on Zoom, you're going to obviously watch us on Facebook Live or later on our YouTube channel, which I will upload this afternoon. We have a few announcements just to mention uh, uh, activities at RIN. Everything has been suspended based on uh, the order to stay at home, more or less, and to not do any non-essential activities. So we are doing our weekly study through a Zoom meeting. We will be using Zoom also for our Thursday Bible study. So if you'd like to join us, uh, contact the office for that uh, information. And if you are on our email list, you would have gotten our weekly email, which tells you essentially what uh, and how to connect with Zoom, the software, and to log in and join us. Um, <clears throat> are there other announcements that we need to share this morning? We are intending to do uh, virtual services until well, through the end of this month. Obviously, it's the end of the month now, but we are going into April with virtual service as well, with services as well. You know, it's a, a difficult time. It's a strange time. It's, a, it's uncharted waters, as many have said, and uh, it's a little hard to pass the peace here when you are out there uh, in your homes, um, but I would hope that you will, in your minds and hearts, share your sense of connection with all of those here at RIM and feel connected in a way that is meaningful for you since we can't be here together to worship. So it's a virtual passing of the peace, as we now I'd like to open with a prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for our church and for one another. We greet each other with your spirit and thought and word. As we think about our congregation, we're mindful of people who we usually see every week. We think of each of them and send them a smile and, and a comforting hug. We miss being together, but know that you will bring us back together someday so that we can celebrate our love for you in this church again. Bless this worship service this morning as we focus on you and put aside all other activities and cares. In Jesus' name. By faith, we trust that we are created in the image of God. In faith, we realize our purpose in being salt and light. By faith, we grow in the light, hoping, dreaming, and making a better world through God's grace and peace. By faith, we grow and learn to face our fears and insecurities, forging a path for witnessing our faith to those around us. By faith, we become hope for others and we bring the word of home in a time of fear and uncertainty. By faith, we follow God's leading day by day. By faith, we trust that God will use us in this time of testing, even when we feel unprepared or inadequate. By faith, we step forward with courage to live each day without fear 
so that your light will shine through us. Amen. Okay, and our first song is from the Faith We Sing book, page 2162, Grace Alone. time of prayer and community. Join me in our prayer recitation right now. God of comfort and love, we cry out to you out of the depths of our souls for your power and grace. We have been caught by worry and fear about this health threat so that we fail to hear your answers of compassion and hope. Help us see that you are with us, willing to help us with our needs. Give us hearts for those around us who are suffering because of COVID-19. Make us instruments of your grace and peace. Amen. This morning, we usually share our prayer concerns and requests, and I have a couple to lift up this morning, Tom Lynn, who is in the hospital, continues to be in the hospital. We want to pray for, for him and Linda in this difficult time when she cannot see him. And, well, they can't see one another. So we want to lift up Tom and Linda Wren in prayer. And Mary Margaret, Marty is doing well. Mary Margaret's son and daughter, daughter <laughs> had surgery last week and she's recovering from it and she's doing very well. So we're glad for that. Are there other prayer requests that you have this morning you'd like to lift up? I'd say all of those folks who are shut in and unable to be with one another in this time when we usually are together. We pray for them and lift them up in this time. Let us go to look the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence and your care that brings calm and brings peace and brings understanding. 
We lift up those mentioned this morning in prayer. We lift up Tom and Linda Lynn as he continues to remain in the hospital uh, for treatment. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We lift up Marty Stenbaugh also, who is recovering from surgery, and we're glad to hear that she's doing well. We pray for her continued recovery and well-being. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, we also lift up those members of this church who are especially feeling the loneliness of not being able to connect with one another, as we usually do. It's a difficult time to be alone. It's a difficult time in general for all of us. We pray for the caregivers, and we also pray for those who are ill with this disease, that you will bless them and give them strength to heal and recover. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And as we consider all those things on our hearts, Lord, we lift them up to you right now in this moment of silence. We thank you, God, for the comfort of your presence, for the silence all around us that helps us calm down and hear your still, small voice. Now we recite the prayer that you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now we will sing a song that's not listed in the order of worship this morning, we changed it to 382, which is more familiar. You might actually even know this by heart. It's called Have Thine Own Way, and we will sing verses 1 and 4.
The scripture today is Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its saltiness, how will it become <clears throat> salty again? It's good for nothing except to be thrown away and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A cry on top of a hill can't be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they put it on top of the lampstand, and it shines on all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before people, so they can see the good things you do, and praise your Father who is in heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. 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 Thank you, Denise. I miss all of you. I miss having you here in, in the pews. I miss having our Bible study. I miss hearing about your lives, seeing you smile, and hearing your voices. It's a tough situation for a pastor whose life is built around connecting people and connecting with people and doing worship in community. I miss the hugs and the handshakes, which we can't do anymore for now. It's hard for me to feel like I'm salt and light in this time. We know we have to answer to the moral compass that God gives us in talking about salt and light. It's just that it's hard to do so when you're following a stay-at-home policy, right? For me, the social isolation is very hard because of the reasons I've just mentioned and that I miss all of you. The whole of my work centers around connecting and relationship, and so I guess the anxiety that I have over this uh, virus is partly about the virus itself, but a lot about not being able to have a normal life and connection with people, which it vitalizes me, and gives me strength and uh, nourishment for going on in life, fellowshipping with the saints. Considering scripture, we understand that salt and light are important for our lives. We also know that Jesus is talking about us and our purpose in this world. In the first section, he uses salt figuratively to help us understand our work in this world. And we all know salt. Some of us would say salt is bad for you if you have high cholesterol and you're told use less salt, but salt is actually important to the nourishment and nutrition of our body. It gives flavor to food, it helps us maintain our health. Sodium is essential for nerve and muscle function. It helps regulate the blood pH and pressure, actually. As Christians, we cannot live without the salt of the spirit, our faith. It gives us an important moral compass in living in our lives and in this world, and particularly in this difficult time when we face this national, international crisis. We've all used or heard the phrase, salt of the earth, and we've heard it referred to people that we know or maybe not know. It's a phrase that brings up thoughts about moral values, uh, example of people who exemplify character, Christian belief, and strength and integrity. Jesus warns us about losing our saltiness and becoming worthless to his mission. We live in a time when our saltiness is being tested. Our character and moral values are on display, aren't they, in our lives? How do we respond to this situation which we, in which we cannot go on as we usually do in our lives and 
follow the paths that we've been on. What ways have you resorted to in order to keep your saltiness, as it were? You can't meet with your Bible study. You can't come to church for worship where you usually find support. First of all, I'm suggesting that you give yourself some compassion for the situation that you face. This is not an easy time since you, you can't connect in the way that you're used to connecting. So try turning inwardly, since you can't move outwardly, turn inward and look to see how God is looking to create something new in you right now that gives you new direction on maintaining your saltiness. You know, it's spring, and we have crocuses popping out of the soil in our yard. Tulips are coming up. You probably have seen signs of spring as well. The green in the field across the street. Soon, things will be budding and flowering. Perhaps this is the time when God is going to germinate something new in your life. Something maybe even completely new. Take your mind off what you cannot do and turn inward to what's going on inside of your feelings about the challenge you face. Now that you have some time, supposedly you should have some time to do this, to just stop and give yourself the chance to feel your feelings. When this all started, what was it? Three weeks ago, Barry, two, three weeks ago. I, it really messed up my routine, as it did all of our routines. I focused on how I could keep working and managing the work that I do. Gradually, it forced me to look inside and sort of examine my frustration and my anxiety about this and to find a way to accept the current stay-at-home order for myself. <clears throat> As I mentioned when we started, I've been sad about not being here with you and not seeing people. But I've accepted the situation, and with that acceptance comes the opportunity for something new to happen in my life. It gives me the opportunity to hear maybe more of what God is trying to say to me. The Bible shows us that in times of dramatic social change and uncertainty, God has the best chance to get people's attention and bring about change for the better. When they were living in slavery in Egypt, the Israelites had a level of comfort. They accepted their enslavement and they managed to maintain their balance with each change until the pharaoh amped it up so high that the lack of ability to adjust to the change forced them to recognize they needed to leave. It made them uncomfortable. They couldn't go on as they usually would. The uncertainty and suffering made, suffering made them leave under the guidance of Moses. When they left, they entered a new life, a new way of being. And we can never go back to the way we have used to be either, although the circumstances are very different for us. Consider what change in your life you've been resisting and what it will take for you to finally accept a new way of being. Consider how you've been inconvenienced by COVID-19 and your response to not being able to go about your business and regular life. How might God be leading into you into a change of a habit or lifestyle for the better? So we see that God uses the uncertainty of our circumstance to build our faith and even increase our saltiness. Hey, why not do something new in your life? 
something you've never done before. Create a new channel of connections to other people. Reach out. I pray that you'll discover something new about being salt, the salt of the earth. The virus has really put us in touch with our own mortality as well because we see that people die from this. It's a very serious concern. It helps us to think about living in the present because we really only have this time. We only have this day. And we should be grateful for it and for the people who God has given us to love and for those who do love us back. The second thought in scripture here is about light. The passage in which he talks about people being the light of the world, bearing witness to the power of Christ in the world. I don't know about you, but I'm not, not feeling much like a lamp into the world right now. It feels like I'm stuck in the closet with a lamp, <laughs> with the door closed. You know what I mean? It, it is not a bad metaphor for describing the situation psychologically. When we're told we can't be together, it's hard to be the light, in the, the light of the world when we're ordered not to congregate. It's also hard because you could argue that the central message of the gospel itself is for us to congregate, be together, build relationship, and spread the good news. In fact, the Methodist Church has developed into an organization that it is today, largely, by congregating and applying the biblical mandate of reaching all people for Christ. I was talking to a parishioner one time uh, about the situation, and he's a retired state patrolman. We were talking about the importance of church on Sunday, and he shared this thought with me, and I'm going to share it with you. He said, I have an appointment with God every Sunday. I don't miss that appointment. <laughs> and he said, I've been stabbed, I've been beaten. <laughs> and uh, he said, but nothing will stop me from that appointment I have with God at church. It was a powerful, powerful thing to say. It echoes the feelings that millions of Christians have at this time. We feel strongly about being in church. And so the point of this is to help us realize that the stay-at-home order creates anxiety in itself because we can't be together. It reminds us of the importance of being together and of how we need each other and rely on each other in our life and in our faith. You know, we know science is leading and we're all following the science and the experts on this virus to follow our protocol so that we can get past it with the least amount of uh, loss of life and uh, social um, upheaval. So I'm not advocating that we reopen the churches, <laughs> but it's helpful to remind ourselves that part of the reason we have uh, been ex experiencing so much stress is because we can't be Matthew 18, 20 reads, For where two or three gather in my name, there I am among them. And in 1 John, verses, uh, 1 John 1, verse 7 reads, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies from all sin. Importance of being together. It helps us see our need for one another. In a book called Real Relationship, Drs. Les and Leslie Parrott, who are psychologists, talk about cultivating good relationships. It's a book about how we develop relationships and intimacy in relationship. In their introduction, they clarify the importance of relationship to personal happiness. And they ask a simple question. When people are surveyed about what makes them happy, 
they give a variety of answers. But at the top of that list is not, not money, it's not property, not prestige, not good looks, none of those things. At the top of that list is belonging. It is the unshakable dependence on other people. We need belonging. We want to be wanted, accepted, and loved. It's called our affirmation drive, they say. The need for connection and belonging is not just a surface value, but one that is a matter of life and death. And they give us an example from World War II. You may have heard this about a fatal disease that they were finding among orphan children. It was called marasmus. You probably have never heard it, but have you heard? It was discovered that these orphan babies who were orphaned from the war were placed in uh, nice facilities, with, they were fed well, they were given toys to play with, and uh, strangely, the health of these children rapidly uh, deteriorated. They soon stopped playing with their toys, some of them stopped eating, their uh, immune systems wore down, and some of these children even died. So the United Nations sent a medical team to look at and uh, study the situation. They came up with a simple prescription fairly quickly, and that prescription was this. For 10 minutes every hour, each child should be picked up by a nurse, hugged, kissed, talked to, and played with. The children regained their appetites and started playing with their toys. They were bright and cheerful. The marasmus was cured. The story helps us see the centrality of relationship and connection for our very survival, actually. They also mention studies, and I'll end briefly with this uh, discussion about the experts, that adults who do not cultivate healthy relationships are twice as likely to die prematurely. And the data indicates that social isolation is as significant, is signif as significant to mortality as smoking, high cholesterol, or obesity. So staying at home and socially isolating, creating distance, produces a very real tension with our deep need to connect as people. It's a tough challenge. So we look at what it means to be the light of the world now in a new way because the pathways of that connection have been closed off for now. We open our minds to God's way of leading us in something new in our lives. We start maybe even doing something new, something we've never done. We consider how our light might shine in times like these. Our church, for example, we did something new last week. We had our first church council meeting on Zoom. It wasn't the same as seeing people face to face, but it was good to see their faces online and hear their voices and interact with them. We're helping members who have never used technology to watch the service online, which is something new in their lives. So as you navigate these uncharted waters, do you see, seek out the safety of the past? Are you holding on for dear life, hoping not to get the virus? Well, I can relate to those concerns but take heart because scripture helps us. And in the Gospel of John 12, verse 36 reads, Believe in the light while you have the light, so that you might become children of the light. In this time of staying at home living, remember that God is using the uncertainty and change to bring about something new in your life. You are the light of the world. And God is kindling the flame within you so you can bear witness to Christ. 
All the little things that you're doing matter very much. The phone calls, the connection, the social media connecting, and the ways you're seeking out to connect all matter a lot. Maybe they're new for you. We have members who go down through a list and make phone calls to other members to check on people, reaching out through technology, because right now the social isolation is, is hard. And we know that an encouraging word or a thoughtful smile can make all the difference in the world. <clears throat> so let's create something new in this time of challenges, something new in our lives, that we might be the salt of the world, and that we might, we might uh, have saltiness to bless the world, and to be the light that we might shine and bear witness to who Christ is, accepting our part and bringing it out, um, his light to those around us who are in need and lacking. One more brief story that touched my heart. This Cody shared this with me. Uh, his, one of his relatives works at King Supers, the one nearby where I live. And he mentioned uh, the story that this uh, relative mentioned. Uh, you remember when the toilet paper crisis first hit? <laughs> and how people were rifling the shelves for toilet paper and there wasn't any. This elderly woman came in with a walker. She walked down to the aisle where the toilet paper was and there was nothing there. And she stood there for a moment, and this uh, worker saw her standing there and went up and approached her. And she asked him, I guess you're out of toilet paper. And he said, just stay right here. And he went to the back, into the back of the warehouse where they store toilet paper and had in a box a few packages, and he brought one out and gave it to this woman and walked her to the front so no one could take her toilet paper. And she thanked him and was tearing up over this kindness, this act of kindness that she had experienced. It's a, something we would not even have thought about two months ago. No toilet paper in the aisles. This is the kind of act that we are called to do. New situations and circumstances. To be the light and salt of the world. So COVID-19 has given us an opportunity to leave the past, the things that we need to let go, and to move forward in our lives to create something new. Maybe even as a church to create something new. <clears throat> 